Hey, back with discussing about peace in our pandemic. And so we've been looking at a variety of scriptures the last several weeks on Thursday nights at our with our church family and discussing the acronym of peace. And so way back several weeks ago, we looked at, uh, starting with P, we looked at uh, what it means to have the presence of God and to practice the presence of God in our life. And so we know that practicing the presence of God really um, for us as believers, it's not just the Holy Spirit, uh, but but the Word of God. And so that's kind of what we started way back several weeks with Hebrews chapter 4. And so I would encourage you to go back and check out that devotional. The E stood for expectations, how we have to kind of navigate and manage our the expectations that we have um, in, in this life based on circumstances and based on what even we expect about God. And we have to make sure that we're basing our expectations on who God says he is, rather than our expectations of who we think God should be. And so we looked at Matthew 11 with John the baptizer and his expectations of Jesus and how he had to listen to what Jesus told him and base his expectations upon Jesus' words and not his own preconceived ideas. Then we looked at A was asking for asking God in prayer. And so we talked a, a bit about prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus tells us to, to not worry about the things of this life even that doesn't mean that we are not to be concerned and and pay attention to and and have good practices about things that are important but there are certain things that we just can't control and we have a father in heaven who cares for us who who cares for the feeds the birds of the air he cares and clothes the flowers of the field and if he cares for those things how much more will he care for those who are created in his image and for those that he spent his life for on the cross and gave his life in in love for us so we have a a great father who cares for us and he invites us to pray to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and so we talked about uh prayer asking god in prayer and that's how we experience peace in this life and then uh we looked at contentment in psalm 23 and how contentment comes uh, with the Good Shepherd, guiding and directing our paths. And sometimes the Good Shepherd will lead us uh, through a valley, but uh, he does it with a great intention, with a great purpose to to then eventually bring us to still waters and eventually to the hope of heaven, where goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and that we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so that is what brings the, the Christian believer contentment and experience in peace, especially in our pandemic. Today we're looking at that last letter for peace and that acronym, and we're looking at the word empathy, the word empathy. And so I want to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is a very familiar, very powerful passage uh, in the Bible where Jesus uh, meets with Lazarus, and Lazarus is dead. He's in a tomb. And what happens to Lazarus? What happens to Jesus whenever he faces dead things? He brings them back to life. That's who Jesus is. That's what he does. That's his power. And so I want to talk about that and the emotions that uh, uh, Jesus encounters with those who uh, were related to to Lazarus and expected Jesus to to save Lazarus before he died on this earth and, uh, and how Jesus gave empathy to Mary and Martha and how what are some lessons we can can learn from that. So John chapter 11, I'm going to read uh, some verses and then talk about them, read some verses, talk about them, and bring out a few points that will help us experience and understand peace with this theme of empathy uh, today. So John chapter 11, I'm going to pick up with verse 1. It says, A certain man was ill. His name was Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus, he was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So now Jesus, he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And so one of the first ways that Jesus loves us and cares for us is he loves us by waiting. Jesus loves us by waiting. It's hard for us to understand that. Jesus loved Mary and Martha. 
but it says he waited two days before he would come to them. And eventually in that time, Lazarus would die. In Jesus' life, he's constantly uh, traveling. We see this in the Gospels. He's traveling all sorts of different geographic locations in, in his public ministry. He walked several miles every single day, it seemed, uh, or for many days of his life. And uh, these last uh, last year, these last several months, have been some of the hardest uh, of his life that he had, had experienced. He experienced uh, exhaustion, certainly from his travels. He experienced opposition and threat on his life. He undoubtedly experienced spiritual warfare. We see Jesus praying many times. Uh, recently in his life, he, a family member, a cousin, uh, John the Baptizer, had, had died and he was murdered uh, by the government of the day, by the Roman government. And all of this weighed on Jesus, was a big, heavy weight on him. And uh, the question is, you know, what's wrong? You know, what, Jesus, can't you just uh, press forward? Are you a little stressed out? Are you are you overworked? Are, are you simply unable to heal Lazarus? Why is it that you're waiting to show up love? But the context of John chapter 11 says it, is that he loved Mary and Martha. He even loved Lazarus. But his waiting is intentional. He says that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through these circumstances. You see, Jesus, he wasn't intentionally trying to be cruel. He was actually trying to be constructive to Mary and Martha's faith. He loved them, and he wanted to build their faith in this moment. And so when we wait on God, waiting on God, it's never wasted. When we're seeking God with our heart, when we're truly seeking him in faith. For God, Jesus, he's seldom in a hurry. When you and I are waiting uh, in a season of life, God's very likely trying to teach us something in our life. He's trying to speak to us. Supremely, He, I believe he's trying to teach us to, 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 to seek him and to rely on him rather than our own human resources. His lack of visible action does not mean his, his lack of affection for us or for Mary and Martha. It's really just that's his approach. And the reason uh, is because that waiting on God, it's, it's not just about what we get, but it's about who we become. And Jesus wants us to become people that reflect his image, reflect his character, and for us to reflect his son, Jesus Christ. And even more, waiting on God, sometimes it's God actually waiting on us. I love what 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, it, sometimes it seems like we are waiting on God to, to work and to act in a certain way based on our expectations, but really God is, is waiting on us to, to trust Him. He's waiting on us to put Him first. He's waiting on us to turn away from things that we shouldn't be relying on. And so waiting on God is often intentional in God's design that He loves us, that He cares for us, and it's, and it's supposed to be instructional and formative for our faith. Jesus not only loves us by waiting, but he loves us by weeping. Jesus loves us by weeping. In this passage, we see both Mary and Martha respond to the illness and sickness and, and, and death of their brother Lazarus. They respond in different ways. Any sister, any individual, they grieve differently. You know, we're not all cookie cutter uh, expressions of emotions in the way that we uh, um, respond to grief or our circumstances. And so, uh, undoubtedly, in this situation with the death of a family member, uh, especially in this custom of the day, many uh, mourners would have been surrounding the, the household of Mary and Martha. There would uh, be wailers, people just wailing and moaning. There would have been flute players. On and on and on was the custom of, of the Jewish faith to, to mourn and green, grieve like this and to do so for, for several weeks. And um, the, many times there would be a period of, 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 of fasting, uh, no bathing, no wearing of clean clothes or clean shoes. And, uh, and so they would just ex express their emotions and their grief in, in this sort of way. And um, 
if you've lost a loved one, uh, uh, whether a family member or a friend, you know that, that grief, it's a, it's a long process. A long process of sorrow and, and sadness and it feels like this unbearable weight uh, of, of a thousand pounds of just pushing on your on your chest on your body and trying to push all the air out of your out of you and it would just kind of maybe ring you empty and uh, and it just seems like maybe even once you just catch your breath that another wave of grief and emotion hits you a memory or something is said or or done by somebody and grief is like those waves of emotion that just keep crashing over us well that's exactly what Mary and Martha are facing and yet Jesus loves them he cares for them and he responds to them each in a unique way he relates to them individually for Martha I'll read in chapter 11 back to the text in verse 21 it says Martha said to Jesus Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. You see, for Martha, she was a bit chaotic and anxious in her expressions. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so she runs to meet Jesus outside of the house. And, 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 and how does Jesus respond to her? He responds to her with this this calm assurance and with this phrase, your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection in life. And so he responds to her with, with truth. Later on, the, the other sister uh, responds not in this anxious, kind of chaotic uh, expression, but more in this contemplative, kind of prayerful moment that they have together. In verse 30, it says, Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, he was still in the place where Martha had met him. Finally, he walks in and says, When the Jews who were with her in their house consoling her, Mary saw, uh, saw, her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. And now when Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him and she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She is more contemplative. She's she's prayerful. She's She's weeping. She's, she's in the house, you know, not running around. And yet Jesus responds to her in a different way. Instead of speaking, uh, speaking to her and kind of maybe asking her about her faith and what she really believes, Jesus responds to her with compassion, with just weeping as well. Verse 33 says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was, he was deeply moved. In his spirit, he was greatly troubled, and he said, where, and, and it says that, uh, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35 says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Um, and so Jesus, uh, what we see here is some very interesting things in this passage. That, um, that Jesus, God, he experiences human emotion. He weeps alongside of us. And so that's exactly what Christianity is. It goes on, verse 36, So the Jews said, See how he loved him, being Lazarus. And some of them said, Could not he who have opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? You see, what Christianity is, is it attaches us to, to Jesus. And Jesus is a person who identifies with us. He relates to us. He knows what it means to go through suffering and the experiences of this world. And he weeps alongside of us. The, the, this language is that he's weeping audibly, not silently. And he's kind of maybe even angry crying, the text is suggesting, centering on this, this heartbreaking of the consequences of, of sin, of death, the reality of death in this world. Perhaps even realizing that in the future, in the very near future, it would, the consequences of sin would bring his own death. And he's centering on this fact and he's grieving 
And he's grieving, I believe, on those who have no hope, who are not trusting in the resurrection. And he wants to point them towards that. So that's what he's going to do in this miracle with Lazarus. Before I move there, Jesus understands our pains. He weeps alongside of us. Hebrews 4.15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. He's able to sympathize with every weakness that we have. And just as Psalm 34, 18 says that the Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. The brokenhearted one, Jesus, is near the brokenhearted ones today. So whatever you're brokenhearted over in this life, in this world, based on your circumstances, the Lord is with you. He weeps alongside of you. And we as Christians are called to follow that very same pattern, to weep with those who are weeping, to mourn with those who are mourning, to offer compassion and care for others, and to bring and speak truth in situations. But most of all, to show up and to be there as a presence, the presence of God in other people's lives. Jesus loves us by waiting, by by weeping. He also loves us by working. Look with me in the text in verse 38. It says, Then Jesus, deeply moved, again came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been there for four days. It was like a four-day funk. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes. He prayed a prayer. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that they always that, that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Jesus loves us by working. You see, Jesus' broken heartedness compelled himself to action. He approached Lazarus' tomb and he commands the people to remove that sealed stone. He's unfazed, he's unstopped by the stench of death. And my friend, if you've ever smelt death, something that's been dead for uh, several hours, uh, several days, four days, you know it's not a pretty smell. Jesus is unfazed, and it doesn't stymie him. He enters in, and he cries out with that loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And indeed, Lazarus came out of that tomb. A dead man was resurrected back to life. And in burial times, in those days, they were wrapped in linen cloths, uh, and they had to unbind him. They had to take those, those grave clothes off because this man was no longer dead. He was alive. And just as Jesus called out Lazarus from that dead, stinky tomb, he calls us out of our dead, stinky tombs as well. He calls us out of dead things that we are living in, that we are walking in, and he calls us to a newness of life. We're reminded, ultimately, that no matter the circumstances that we face, that death may be our greatest enemy. But for Jesus, for those who believe and put their faith and trust in Jesus, death is not deadly. Death is not deadly for us as Christians because it's simply a doorway into eternal life, into the resurrection life. So religion is dead, but Christ is alive. Christianity is alive. And so that is the, the hope that we have. That's, the, that's what brings us ultimate peace in, in all the circumstances that we face. And so no pandemic should should hang and loom over us in such a way that we just panic and fear. We should have a sense of confidence that Jesus is going to get us through no matter what, whether it's in this life or the one to come. And he works in life-giving ways. And that is now our mission as well, to be life-given in a world that is filled with death and stench, in a world that is focused on all the things that are without hope of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to be life-giving, to speak hope, to work for the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. We can get so caught up in conspiracy theories and stats and figures and things that will only matter 
for just but a mere footnote in all of history. But we are focused on eternal history. We are focused on eternity future. And so therefore, we're not to be building this kingdom of this world. We're to build the kingdom of God. And that is what is life given. That's where our focus is to be as believers. I want to leave it with, with you just a couple challenges uh, today. Is that all in the Gospel of John, there are several I am statements. I would encourage you to, to read through the Gospel of John and to find them, to highlight them in your Bible. And then to kind of reflect upon each I am statement of who Jesus is. I am, and then Jesus makes a statement about his character, his, his identity. These are things, these are statements that we can put our faith and trust in, that we can build our life on, and that make sure that we have an appropriate focus. I believe that would be a great encouragement to you and help you then to empathize with others and to speak those words that Jesus spoke and to share them with others. In fact, could I even encourage you with this one verse today, John eleven twenty five, 25, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. Could I encourage you, challenge you to share that verse, John eleven twenty five, 25, with three people in these next several days? Make it a goal in the next week to share John eleven twenty five 25 with three people. And not only just the focus about death as if they might be dying. They might be, I don't know. But most importantly, to speak about the resurrection life, the, the, the confidence and the hope that we have to live life on a daily basis in that way. And so encourage people with that verse. All in all, I believe God will lead you if you pray a prayer and ask God to show you who you should share John eleven twenty five 25 with. I believe he'll, he'll help show you in the next several days to come. All in all, I hope and pray that you are experiencing peace in this pandemic, that uh, your world is not rocked, that your life is not built on shift and sand, but on the, the, the truth, the foundation of God's word. And that's what we've hoped to do uh, over these last several weeks is to point us to texts that will help us during this time. God's timeless truth. All in all, church family, friends, if you're listening, uh, thank you for tuning in and God bless you.